Zoom, you can always you can always jump over to Facebook Live at facebook.com slash slash CA preservation. Uh, so we look forward to the start of this program. We have about two minutes left. Feel free to let us know where you're from in the chat box. We have 35 people logged in right now. So thank you for attending today. We're uh, about to go live on Facebook. It's 8.59, so we have one minute left until the start of the program. Welcome, everybody. We look forward to the start of the program. Again, if, uh, if you have any questions for our panel, please use the Q&A box. And if you have uh, questions for us, uh, our produ the producers, or if you uh, want to make a comment, uh, use the chat box. Welcome. Uh, John says that there is some construction going on, so I'm going to do some of this introduction. Welcome to our session. Uh, this is the Getty session, and we are live on Facebook as well, so welcome everybody out there in the streaming space. Uh, I would like to just go over a few things. My name is Chris Madrid French. I'm Director of Development at California Preservation Foundation, and uh, we encourage you to chat the entire time that we're having this conversation, and you can share uh, links or anything that you find valuable to to add to the discussion. I see already a couple of our friends from Hawaii have already posted in the chat. So go ahead if you feel like it and post uh, where you're calling in from in that chat window. If that window bothers you while we're having our session, you can minimize that or drag it to the side. Uh, we're also using closed captioning for this so that uh, we can ensure access for everyone. And the Q&A box at the bottom is the best place where you can type in your questions that we will be answering. The session is gonna be a little different because and we really want to encourage some discussion. So um, I see a lot of people coming in the room. So please do uh, use that Q&A box early and often as John likes to say. So um, I'm going to run right into this and I'd like to introduce our panelists for today uh, who, are, uh, who are very generously providing their expertise and their time. So Chandler, Gail, and Anna, you can go ahead and turn on your cameras. Hi, well, welcome and thank you for uh, for coming on to this panel today. Sorry, I'm still getting going. Uh, so what I'd like to do is I will uh, let you, Chandler, go ahead and do the introductions. And John and I will be in the back end working on the chat and the, and the production. Uh, and then John will be sharing the slides. So Chandler, when you're ready for that, just go ahead and he can start that share. I gotta get you on mute. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for that introduction, Chris, and thank you everyone who's watching today. Um, I'm here with my two colleagues from the um, Getty Conservation Institute, Anna Gonsalves and Gail Ostergrand, and we're going to be discussing the Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative, uh, all three of us work in this initiative within the GCI. We're each gonna be talking about a component of the work that we've been recently doing to give you an introduction, um, focusing uh, specifically on some of our recent publications. So um, I'm Chandler McCoy. I manage the GCI's Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative, which we fondly call the CMAI. The Getty Conservation Institute has been around since 1987 and has been working in the field of cultural heritage conservation in many parts of the world since that time. It 
previously has focused on the more traditional areas of conservation, uh, working in the fields of classical archaeology and traditional building conservation. However, in 2012, the GCI, GCI launched the CMAI with the goal of advancing the practice of conserving the built heritage from the modern era. Although this was a new field for the GCI, it was a not a especially new area for conservation since interest in conserving modern heritage has been growing since the late 1980s. The CMI, CMAI is a bit of a newcomer in this field following on the pioneering work done by Docomomo, the National Park Service, the National Trust, even CPF, and um, the several other important organizations, both American and international, that are interested in modern heritage. So we are building on the work already done in this field and trying to add to the knowledge that has already been gained. Next slide, please. The CMAI focuses on four areas of practice in order to advance our work. First of these is creating information and tools, by which I mean mainly publishing technical and conservation information in the forms of books, manuals, and guidelines. The second area is education and training, uh, such as the four-day introductory course we have offered since 2018 on conserving modern architecture. Uh, we will be offering this course this year online. The third area is materials conservation, where we focus on a particular modern material that needs additional attention, such as reinforced concrete or architectural plastics. Uh, the final area is our field projects, where we partner with organizations that own a modern building to provide technical guidance. Our first two field projects were here in California. This includes the Teak Restoration Project at the Salt Institute for Biological Studies in La Jolla and the House of Charles and Ray Eames in Pacific Palisades. We've been working on a variety of scientific investigations at the Eames House, culminating in our writing of a conservation management plan for the Eames House in 2019. Our newest field project is the Government Museum and Art Gallery in Chandigarh, India, designed by Le Corbusier. We are conducting a multi-year environmental monitoring program, which will lead to recommendations for how to improve the interior environment of both the art, which is housed in the building, and for the people who work there. Next slide. Um, today, I wanna to highlight um, our publications, as I said, and I want to start with our new case study series, which is called Conserving Modern Heritage, Case Studies in Conservation Practice. We've heard from our colleagues in the field of architecture and academia that case studies are a very important way to disseminate information on best practices, and so this series hopes to fill an important knowledge gap. We published the first volume on conserving concrete in 2019, and our second volume called Managing Energy Use in Modern Buildings will be available for purchase in the late summer of this year. Also in the works for this series is a volume of case studies demonstrating how planning and management tools can protect and conserve modern places. And another upcoming volume on the conservation of 20th century urban areas. We're trying to cover a wide variety of topics in this series and are also interested in hearing new ideas for future volumes. So that's all I have to say in my intro, and now I'll pass the mic to my colleague, Anna Paula, who will talk about her focus on concrete. So next slide, please. And next one. Thank you, John. Uh, so my focus uh, here at the Getty is the co uh, Concrete Conservation Project, uh, which is part of the Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative. It seeks to support people that work with the conservation of 20th century concrete heritage by focusing on some of the challenges in this field with development of research, training, and publications. The Conservation Principles for Concrete of Cultural Significance was published by the GCI in English in 2020, and very recently in Spanish and in French. It is available for free download, download from our website. 
The goal of these conservation principles is to guide decisions in the conservation of culturally significant concrete by establishing a methodology that combines concrete repair and conservation approaches. We see the collaboration between the concrete repair and conservation fields as a great asset to the conservation of concrete heritage. Each one of them contributes a key part in the expertise required to make sure concrete made heritage is passed on to our future generations. But in order to work together, we need a shared methodology to solve the conflict that can often come from trying to balance concrete repair and conservation requirements. The principles we describe in this publication recognize that conservation of concrete, oh, sorry, the next slide, please. <laughs> Um, so we recognize that um, the, con the conservation of concrete requires the same thoughtful, careful approach of other materials that are more typically associated with heritage sites. And the conservation of principles for concrete follow the typical conservation process, which you can see here in this, in this chart, um, from widely adopted conservation charters and guiding documents. Um, and where the, in, in this um, process, the conservation is really grounded in the identification of the significance of a site and the challenges to conserve it. Next slide, please. The conservation principles for concrete recognize that standards and best practices in concrete repair can be successfully used in concrete conservation as long as there is clarity from the start of the project of the conservation principles guiding the decision making process. We should also recognize that conservation of concrete presents a higher level of challenge than everyday concrete repair. For example, the, the investigation phase may reveal materials and techniques that are unusual in current construction practices. Another added challenge is in the development of, of a repair and treatment strategy where conservation requirements can severely restrict treatment and repair options, especially when aesthetics are important. Next slide. The concrete conservation process that you see here in this flow chart marries concrete repair and conservation methodologies. This process is cyclic and it starts from project planning, followed by understanding the building and conservation needs, developed conservation strategy, implementation and maintenance and monitoring, which can trigger the restart of the process. You can download this flow chart as a separate file from our website as well. And now I'm going to pass the mic to my colleague, Gail. Hey, thanks, Anna Paula. Um, so I'm going to just introduce one of our most recent publications, which is the 20th Century Historic Thematic Framework. Um, <clears throat> this was published early this year. And it is a tool to assist in, in identifying and contextualizing the heritage of the 20th century. Um, <clears throat> it's intended to promote broad thinking about historical processes that shaped the 20th century um, built environment globally. Uh, it identifies principal uh, social, technical, political, economic um, phenomena that shaped the 20th century around the world. And it covers a wide variety of, of um, heritage typologies, you know, buildings and other types of structures, cities, industrial heritage landscapes and so forth. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this um, uh, framework had a, a long journey into existence. Um, it was a joint project the Getty Conservation Institute and the ECOMOS 20th Century Heritage International Scientific Committee, which is a mouthful, so I'll call it the ISC. Um, and ISC initiated this project in 2009. You know, they um, came up with this developing this framework and the GCI joined them in the effort in 2011. Um, the catalyst for the work was really the kind of the lack of recognition and protection of 20th century heritage and challenges to contextualizing it when, you know, when making decisions about 20th century places. And the ISC was especially interested in, in helping the World Heritage Center to identify a more di a diverse array of 20th century sites. 
um, and to foster the comparative analysis of sites. Um, so our, our goal was to really move beyond the works of the great architects and important works of architecture and styles that, that really currently dominate the collection of 20th century places on the World Heritage List and, and to take a more holistic range at the full complexity of the 20th century and the places that represent um, uh, historical developments. Um, and finally, we wanted to produce a framework that could be used globally, but could also be adapted um, to national and local contexts. Um, next slide, please. So we considered a vast array of possible topics and themes and ultimately distilled them into 10 interconnected historic themes that really repre that represent the principal drivers of the 20th century as related to, um, to place. Um, and within each of these themes, we identified a number of sub-themes. Um, and then each of the 10 themes is explored in an essay. Um, next slide, please. And in, a, in addition to the essays, info, information about each of the 10 themes is conveyed in, in this publication in two other repeating elements and all of these things work together. So um, each, for each theme, there is a chart like the one we're looking at here and there is a photo gallery. Um, and as I said, each of the themes is broken into you know, a number of sub-themes. In this particular chart, you see uh, sub-themes on the left, um, which you know, expand upon the main theme. And then we have identified types of places that relate to the themes and sub-themes. So this is the connection from the, from the overarching theme to types of places and finally to individual places. Um, we identified a wide range of types of places that exemplify each theme. So just for example, we're looking at the um, sub-themes and types of places that we identified in the theme of popular culture and tourism. And I'm gonna jump under the sub-themes to the three at the bottom, growth and promotion of tourism, development of visitor service facilities, and birth of automobile-based travel. So obviously these are sub-themes that we identified under the theme of tourism. And then we come to the types of places and you know, many of these places would relate to tourism, but I'm just gonna highlight a few. Airports, bus stations, um, lodgings and accommodations, restaurants, roadside attractions and, and rest stops. So it's a, a multiplicity of types of places, um, not all of sub themes would be found in every location. Um, and, and this certainly is not an exhaustive list. Uh, our point here is to encourage users to, to modify these lists, to add to them, to delete, delete from them, you know, based on their own geographic context. Um, next slide, please. And then the third repeating element for each theme is a photo gallery. Um, and this photo gallery for each theme represents, you know, a, a, a range of place types. You know, there are between 10, let's say between 10 and 15 um, places shown for each theme. Um, and these are types of places that could be identified under the theme. So we, we're not proposing sites for listing. Um, some of the places we've represented may already be listed. Um, Others, you know, might be candidates and others, frankly, never will be. But our point here is to show really a, a range of examples of types of places that relate to these themes and sub themes. Um, and again, we want to promote broad thinking. So the examples here, and this is actually a page from one of the photo galleries in the um, uh, popular culture and tourism theme, you know, we see a hotel, the hotel, um, uh, the Havana Riviera Hotel in Cuba. Uh, at center, we see the Jumbo Kingdom floating restaurant in Hong Kong, which if I ever find my place my, myself in Hong Kong, it's a pretty spectacular looking place. Um, and finally, we've got the um, Kenyatta International Conference Center in, um, in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I want to emphasize that this thematic framework is it's a jumping off point for further action and research. Um, and it can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, its purpose really is to give those who are tasked with identifying and protecting and interpreting the heritage of the 20, 20th century um, with, with a framework and a methodology that can help them to um, achieve those goals. So, you know, ultimately its purpose is to expand the recognition and appreciation of, of, and, and protection of the heritage of the 20th century. 
So it can be used in creating inventories and surveys at, you know, at any level, at local, region or regional, national levels, and, and can serve to help identify heritage places. Um, it can be used to contextualize the 20th century history and relate it to place. And I want to emphasize that the thematic framework is not a history of the 20th century. It is a tool for contextualizing history. Um, you can use it to diversify heritage listings, make sure that you're including a wide range of buildings, types and sites that broadly reflect um, historical processes and reflect what's important within each um, individual locale. Uh, it can be used to inspire and, and should be, hopefully will be used to inspire additional theme studies. Um, and it can be used in developing comparative analysis or in historical research. So uh, it has a lot of um, potential applications. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, our hope for the, for the framework is that it is um, broad enough, but clear enough that it can be adapted and applied most anywhere in the world. Um, we already know of several places where it is being considered um, for surveys of 20th century um, heritage in both Africa and Latin America. So that's exciting to us and, and we hope to hear of, of a lot more places where it is um, being, uh, being applied and utilized. Um, and uh, lastly, I wanna note that it is one of the publications that's available for download on our website um, for free. So, and there will be uh, a French language version uh, coming sometime in the next few months. And then uh, after that, a Spanish language version. So we are, are really trying to um, broaden our reach with these publications. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, that's good. And then finally, the last slide, uh, just thank you on, on behalf of Chandler, Anapala and myself. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Chris. I'm coming. Sorry, I got lost. I was trying to I was trying to put that link real quick, Gail. Maybe um, John, you could put that in the chat. The one that's like the TCHTF. I typed it in wrong and it wasn't working. So sorry, I got lost in the Zoom sorry. land. But thank you all for um, for for presenting this. We do have quite a big audience here and an audience on Facebook. So. I, what the real uh, reason that I persuaded all of you to come on to our conference was because I wanted as many people as possible to see this information and to uh, get it in their hands because you've worked so hard on this on this documentation. Um, it took about 10 years or something. Is that right, Gail? How long have you been working on some of these documents? Oh, gosh. Well, the, the thematic framework, um, we... You know, we began collaborating with um, the ISC in 2011 on it, and um, in fact, you were there, Chris, at the at the birth of this. Um, we hosted a an international experts meeting. We brought, I think, about 10 or 12 people from various parts of the world who have e expertise in thematic frameworks and have used these. And they were representatives of of many organizations of Dokomomo of. Um, uh, Tiki, which is, uh, deals with industrial heritage um, from the ISC 20C. Um, we had uh, uh, Chris at that time. I, I can't remember if you were still working with the National Trust on Modern Heritage or- uh, that, Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. You were, yeah. So we had the National Trust represented. So we really had um, uh, brought in voices from, from around the world who are concerned with 20th century heritage. Um, and we had that meeting and that resulted in a, um, Kind of a preliminary, we brainstormed a lot of ideas about what might be within this um, thematic framework, and we identified an initial collection of potential themes and sub-themes. And, um, and then a little bit of time passed before we started actively working on this project again. Um, and, and we picked up from where that, uh, where that experts meeting had left off and, um, and really began working on it in earnest. We, put together a international committee, again, representing some of these same organizations. Um, we called it a peer, peer review, PR, PRG, peer review group, no, not peer review, project review group, um, to help advise us on this. And we um, uh, engaged consultants to help us with, with drafting the document and uh, you know, worked on it over, it took us several years to actually bring it to fruition. 
Well, you can tell, I mean, because you can tell the research is so thorough. I have a couple of questions I wanted to ask all three of you, and then we're going to go to the Q&A. And uh, as, as we always like to say, question early and often here at CPF. So go ahead and start posting any questions you might have. And John is also monitoring the Facebook feed. If you have questions in Facebook, uh, if you're watching from there, you can also post a question. And, and John and I will take some of those in a few minutes. One of the things I wanted to ask was, I have my little questions right here. But you talked about the theme scale and the themes are meant to be global in nature, but are the themes applicable to all places? I mean, that's one of the things that I enjoy about modernism is it occurs everywhere. Uh, can you just go into that a little bit? Well, we believe that, that the 10 themes are broad enough that probably some mention of them um, played out, you know, in most places and certainly experiences are very different, but um, you know, I mean, as a, for instance, within the, within the theme of um, um, world trade and global corporations, you know, that's going to play out very differently in, you know, in, in places around the world, but in, in some way, you know, globalization has, has probably touched most places, but, you know, like to give a very example um, in Los Angeles, where we have, you know, uh, what is now probably the largest, the busiest container point port in North America, you know, globalization and world trade plays out very differently here than it does in a place like Phoenix, you know, where there is no port. So um, the stories that are told will be different, but there's, you know, there's going to be some element of that probably in most places. Um, but the, you know, the beauty of a document like this is it gives users kind of a jumping off point. I, I, we, we believe that we were very thorough in covering a possible range of themes mm -hmm. that, that are global. Um, and that gives someone trying to look in their own context, their own geographic context, a, a head start. How, how can I hook into these themes or can I? You know, and in some, in some cases, um, maybe not so much. I appreciate that. Uh, I wanted to show a couple of images, uh, and then I will also ask some, you know, everyone knows that concrete is absolutely one of my favorite things of all time. So I will get to you, Anna Paula. But um, I had a couple of images. Um, some people were mentioning in the chat that how impressive the images are. And I pulled a couple that you had actually recommended, Gail, if you can uh, maybe let me just share the screen. Uh, and um, move my little box out of the way. Uh, if you want to just sort of explain, how did you pick out some of these uh, more interesting images? Well, yeah, as I said, we wanted, I see Anna Paula smiling because these um, phone booths are in her home country in, uh, these are in um, Brazil. And I can't pronounce the Brazilian word for them, but it translates to roughly big ears. So um, these are, public telephone booths, and they were constructed between the 1970s and the 1990s. I mean, and I think, you know, public telephones are, for those of us living here in North America, certainly, you know, largely a thing of the past. You may see kind of ghost telephone booths around, but the equipment is, if it's there at all, is just kind of battered and hanging. Um, but, but this was really, you know, for in many places and for many people, certainly when you went away from, from home in the era of, of, before the era of the cell phone, this was how you could get in touch with people. And, you know, in many places there wasn't availability of home telephone service. And so to have a public access phone, whether on the street or whether in the, you know, the post office oftentimes would be a place that you would go and, you know, and, and pay to use a telephone. Um, you know, it represents the development of telecommunications in the 20th century. Right, and then also I think that, oh, I see Chandler, go ahead Chandler, what do you so want to add? Point out what, one of the reasons I love this image is because you see this man here uh, propping his elbow against the, the, <laughs> the thing. He's making a call on his iPhone. <laughs> you know? But, uh, and I, as I, I understand it, I think this photo is from Sao Paulo and I think they've, begin, they've begun to list and landmark these structures. Isn't that right, Anna? I'm not sure if they they got to the point of landmarking them. There's definitely been more recognition about them. Uh, and very recently, I just saw a friend of mine posting that they are 50 year old this year. Um, and they, they've been disappearing at a very fast pace because nobody uses uh, public phones anymore. Um, so it, it they're the next generation is not going to know this this dear, very dear structure. 
Uh, uh, well, Anna, how about some of these? I know there's some, I've seen some maybe in Croatia, I think that are of concrete, like, you know, like really, maybe I'm thinking also of roadside stops, but I know that there are some of these sort of uh, side uh, structures uh, that may or may not have any use anymore. And how do you uh, handle that with, if you, if like, if you had a concrete, uh, you know, a roadside structure, what are some of the ways that in your study that this conservation and the, the principles can be applied for something like that? Um, well, the, the conservation principles, they're really meant as, as a decision-making tool that can be applied for any type of, of, of concrete. We didn't restrict it to, a, uh, to iconic buildings or, or um, specific types of, mm -hmm. of concrete. Uh, on, we, on, very unintentionally, we decided to keep it very broadly. Mm -hmm. um, and not specific treatments, right? I mean, you don't actually recommend specific treatments. It's more of a, a, of a guideline. Yeah, exactly. Oh, good. All right, we'll get back to the images. I just like to jump around a little bit. So, uh, so uh, Gail, how did how did this end up in there? I mean, I'm, we kind of have a hint. Why don't you tell us, everybody, what building this is? Well, this is um, uh, Synagogue um, Beth Shalom. It's in Elkins Elkins Park, I think it's Elkins or Elkins Park. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name. Pennsylvania. It's a it's a um, suburb of um, Philadelphia, and it is a, a late Frank Lloyd Wright building. Um, which had a very interesting story behind its design, but that's in fact not why we included it. Um, and, and I chose to show this image, you know, I gave this image to Chris partly because I wanted to emphasize these photo galleries, as we said, are meant to provoke broad thinking. And um, we didn't always want to represent a building in the most obvious way. So this is a great work of architecture. It's a Frank Lloyd Wright, but but um, the story that we used it to tell was the a story of um, uh, the move of, um, you know, in this case, this was an early 20th century um, congregation that was founded in, you know, in the center of Philadelphia in an urban neighborhood. Um, but in the post-war era, as the congregants themselves began to migrate out from the city to the suburbs, um, uh, Beth Shalom, you know, engaged Frank Lloyd Wright uh, remarkably to, you know, to build this. But again, the Frank Lloyd Wright piece isn't the important part of the story in the way that what we chose to focus on. It's this trend of the movement of people and religious organizations from the cities to the suburbs. And, you know, while we placed this image in the um, chapter that's on religion and cultural institutions and so on, the, the, that theme, we could have just as easy put it in the urbanization theme to talk about suburbanization. Um, so I think it's, an, it's also important for representing um, or, or for you know, uh, showing how the meanings of places are multi-layered and a tool like the thematic framework can help you get at all these different stories and not just go for the obvious one. I appreciate that. Uh, let's go to this next image. Uh, what is this building, Gail? <laughs> this is the Sydney Opera House, um, and uh, in you know in Sydney, Australia, it's um, it's on the World Heritage List. I mean, this is a you know a masterpiece of architecture. But but again, as with the um, synagogue, we chose to place this in in the the chapter that was on accelerated you know technological advances um, because it was one of the earliest applications of um, computer aided uh, design in structural analysis. Um, so we emphasize the technological aspects of the construction of this building rather than this building, I should say, rather than um, its significance as a cultural institution and as an icon of, of architecture. I got one more for you. This is fun, like a surprise show. Okay. All right, and our last kind of provocative image, um, this is the uh, remains of the Union Carbide um, plant at, at Bhopal. Um, 1984, you know, the, the site of a horrific uh, human and, um, and uh, uh, natural disaster when an industrial, you know, an industrial accident that brought about accident that uh, was a, a human and, and um, natural disaster. And so the remains of it, um, you know, stay there, uh, still unresolved and still toxic, um, but it, you know, really represents um, we place this in the in the chapter on um, 
preserving the natural and, and uh, built environment. Um, and, you know, it, it certainly represents, uh, well, <laughs> an important, an important um, theme in that, in that area. And again, mm -hmm. this is something that could have fit under the, under the theme of um, uh, international uh, world trade. You know, it was mm -hmm. a Western corporation located in, in, uh, in India. I, I just wanted to point out the, you, like, for example, some people may look at that image and wonder why such a yeah. decrepit building. Um, you know, and we're with these images and with the themes, we're really trying to get away from an emphasis on building fabric and architectural significance mm -hmm. and show images that maybe um, will represent social significance or in the case of this environmental disaster, these are sort of political or environmental issues. So we wanted to pick photos that give um, you know, that don't that maybe deviate a little bit from a traditional way of presenting heritage as being mostly about, you know, materiality or building famous buildings. And we wanted to, you know, make people think about uh, a variety of other values like social, um, political things like that that, sh that shape the built environment. Definitely. And, and, and based on that um, position, I noticed in the chart that you showed, Anna, and I think you might have showed a similar chart, which shows that when you're doing your analyses, you analyze significance before integrity, which is important. And I and this was a conversation that we had in one of the sessions yesterday that California, I believe, follows significance before integrity. But a lot of other, at least in the United States, uh, many uh, regions do not. So first they just say, is there anything left? And then we'll decide if it's important. And so can you maybe just go in a little bit why it's so important to, to understand significance bef before you, you go to that next step of integrity? Um, well, I think it's, it's just because sig significance can uh, be in so many, um, represented in so many different ways on that building. It doesn't necessarily have to be the, the materiality. Uh, sometimes it's, it's the use, is the intangible, uh, is the the remembrance, like in the the like the human human loss in the case of an of, of a, a disaster that happened there. So there are so many other things than the material integrity of of, of the place, uh, and the material does support that all those other values. So um, it just makes I think it makes it a little bit easier if you have that uh, overall and global understanding of the, the entire significance before you dive into what the material is, what's left there. Um, and how, and, and then you, you start asking that question, how to, to uh, conserve that building with all of that in, in mind and, and prioritizing that significance. I mean, it's so important. Otherwise, you would miss places like that, like we just showed in that last image. You would say, "Well, I don't know about integrity, so we're not going to go that next step." And that's definitely the case in some um, states that they're just uh, there's the building or the site or the landscape never even gets to the point of being analyzed uh, because it doesn't look historic. You know, I've had to deal with a lot of that. Um, I, you might have answered this before, Gail, but I'm wondering um, how are these thematic frameworks related to the theme studies and the context statements that are more commonly used in U.S. historic preservation practice? They're in the same family. Um, uh, you know, they're they're these are all kind of these are all thematic approaches to to contextualizing history and and um, and analyzing place. Um, and, you know, I would say that this, this particular framework, since we took a global um, look, you know, it identifies really big themes, um, but it's a, it's a framework that anyone anywhere could begin to hang these other types of studies off of, you know, when you begin looking at these themes and then starting to consider them in your own geographic locale, you can begin to identify where you need to do more research and that could take the form of a context study or you know, or a, a thematic study. 
Okay. Oh, I thought you had something to say, Chandler. I thought that was the Chandler, I have something to say face. Um, so, but these principles that you've outlined, they don't give specific guidance on, on how to do repairs and treatments as we talked about, Anna. So are there any future publications underway that would address some of these issues? Uh, yeah, we've, we've, uh, we have partnered with the French uh, Laboratoire de, de uh, recherche, recherche de Monuments Historiques. They are the, like, the national laboratory that researches uh, heritage sites in France. And uh, they, they published um, a couple of years ago in French and um, text only. And it's about the uh, cleaning for historic concrete. Uh, and it's based on a very thorough research that they, they've done in the past, uh, comparing different types of, of techniques. So that's one thing we're, we're doing, and it's uh, going to be our, our next publication coming out, coming out uh, before the end of the year. Um, and we'll uh, provide it, as, as always, available uh, for free on our website. That's wonderful. Um, that's great. Uh, I wondered if we could talk about the case study books for a minute, and then we'll go into the question and answer. So um, with this, uh, what kind of, what lessons did you learn in compiling the energy management case studies? Well, let's see. I mean, we, we pick these case study books because we think they'll answer some important questions. And I, I think um, for modern heritage, energy management is sort of uh, the Achilles heel. I mean, a lot of people say modern architecture is, you know, is, a, is an energy hog. Modern architecture squanders electricity and it's, you know, you can't heat it and cool it properly. Uh, so we really wanted to address that and show examples of buildings that, where that's possible. And I guess we, we, we did a call for case studies and we got, we narrowed it down to the, the 10 that we included and we started to see patterns emerge. Um, and one of the things we realized is that if you're trying to conserve an important significant work of modernism and you're also trying to improve its energy conservation or its uh, thermal comfort for the inhabitants, uh, it's really important to start with a, a light touch and begin by looking at what's inherent in the building to begin with. And I mean, very often the original architects may have had a strategy for controlling you know, the sun or for heating the building that's been lost over the years or it's been replaced because some better technology came along. So we think it's important to start by really looking at the building and understanding what, how it was designed originally to perform. And if those original features can be brought back, it's, it's a great way to conserve the building and it's a, it's a really low impact. So you should always start with the low impact strategies and work your way up to the more significant ones. I mean, in terms of his, historic building conservation, replacing all the windows of, of a building is a fairly drastic thing to do. And um, you know, so you shouldn't take these steps lightly. You should work your way into it. And basically you also have to understand that building systems are completely integrated and you can improve the energy performance of a, of a modern building by in, improving the, the mechanical systems and maybe able to leave the, the glazing intact or some of the things. Um, it's a little more complicated to do things like insulation on modern buildings. Modern buildings tend not to have, you know, attics and in terms of say a brutalist concrete building, the, the concrete wall is both the interior finish and the exterior finish. It's really hard to put, to slap insulation on a, on a concrete building sometimes. Um, so you have to be very creative. You have to really understand the building. Um, and you have to start with an idea that you want to work your way up to, to interventions by starting with the least intrusive invasive things first and moving and seeing how much you can achieve uh, that way. And um, anyway, that's what the book, that's what the book is talking about. And that's the lesson we learned just by uh, seeing the case studies and learning the lessons that they taught. 
Right. I think it's a it's such a complicated question because when while you were talking, Chandler, I was thinking, well, it could be my modern house, or it could be a modern office building, or it could be in Hawaii or Canada or France or Africa, all completely different uh, situations in terms of climate. And do you think when you're talking about energy, is it uh, people's also comfort? Like, I mean, we all remember when uh, we didn't even have air conditioning in the car. I don't know. Anna probably doesn't remember that. But so I think people's comfort level actually changes. And now we expect to be uh, air conditioned and heated at all at all points, at least in some areas. Do, does that at all affect the way that people look at um, retrofitting buildings for energy efficiency? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point, Chris. I mean, absolutely. People's expectations have changed a lot. You know, when Le Corbusier was designing some building in 1925, um, people would have been happy in a house that got cold in the winter and they would have just added more sweaters. I don't think people are like that now. People expect year-round comfort and, year, you know, they expect to be warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Actually, adding air conditioning to, to unair conditioned buildings is an incredibly difficult task and um, it's very challenging, but you can't tell people they can't have it. I mean, uh, nobody would put up with that, um, but it is hard, especially because modern buildings tend to not have the sort of spaces where you can hide the duct work or maybe it's a flat roof so you can't hide your air conditioning equipment at all. So you have to be creative and you have to look for ways to, to, do, to add these systems to buildings. And of course, the original designers, when they designed, they didn't have the tools about to even calculate how the building was going to perform. You know, they did the best they could in the 1950s or 60s. And in fact, in the 60s, maybe they didn't even care that much about using energy because fuel didn't cost very much. So it's a big challenge. It's a challenge that all buildings uh, face as we try to be greener and you know reduce our carbon footprint. Um, so it's it's difficult. And um, and I want to talk about a little bit inverse and really more from the personal viewpoint of the three of you because I know you've been in thousands of historic structures all over the world. Something that I've always thought would add to my own experience of a historic structure is to not have the air conditioning on. So if you go, I know, and this is a, a conflict between preservation of the material and the things inside the building. Uh, so I'm thinking of a place, um, like some places in Florida, like for instance, Vizcaya, which is a beautiful, uh, you know, um, 1920s-ish estate, huge. It used to be all open to the air. Obviously it's on the bay in, in Miami, there's no air conditioning. And it has this, pro and has amazing capabilities, but we can never experience it that anymore because now it's been completely enclosed because it has for preservation. What is your experience, the, the three of you, if you'd like to comment on, on that sort of like addition to the understanding that historic sense of the energy efficiency, we don't even have opportunity to, to experience that as much anymore. Yeah. Um, well, one thing that comes to mind is this, uh, is the field project that we're working on in Chandigarh, India, which is this museum designed by Le Corbusier. And um, it was designed to be uh, passively cooled and naturally ventilated. And over the years, they've added, they've air conditioned certain bits of it and um, other pieces have not, and they've enclosed some of the open PLOT areas and they've done all these things to it over the years so that it doesn't work the way it was intended to. And we're trying to work with the, um, with the museum to see if we can remove some of that mechanical equipment and if it could perform the way it was designed, um, you know, maybe that would work, but. It's, it's tough because you want to preserve our, for instance, um, uh, Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's estate in Virginia. And he incorporated as a as a sort of architect his own ways to keep that his building cool in the 19th century. And of course, now it has to be air conditioned because so many people are coming through and they have original artifacts inside the building. But I always thought it'd be so amazing to experience that with the airflow uh, naturally. But um, I, I would like to have John come on and we open the uh, room up to some Q&A. I see we have a couple of things in there. 
and I know John is in, in the background someplace getting ready. So uh, here he comes. Sorry, I, I'm answering the phone. <laughs> we are very um, busy today. Uh, yeah, John, do you um, want to go ahead and take a question from the Q&A? Uh, sure, yeah, I'll take the first one. And um, the, the question has been upvoted uh, twice, so I'll take that one first. And it's about um, the, the sites that you highlighted that included uh, telescopes. Um, and it, uh, the question is, in the case of Mauna Kea, the indigenous groups are extremely opposed to the mountaintop observatories and have been spending years advocating for their removal as they clash with the sacred view shed. How do you speak to the preservation of sites that may not be supported by local indigenous populations? Well, that's a really hard question. Um, you know, we. We talked, Anna sort of introduced this idea of, of values, and that's a difficult problem because it's there are many conflicting values, and the indigenous people value the site in a completely different way than we do as, as modern Westerners, for example, or scientific investigators. Um, and that is a case where these values are pitted against each other. And, um, you know, it isn't up to us to say one set of values is more important than the other. Um, you know, we might, uh, we might um, apply our modern, uh, the thematic framework to it and say it's an extremely important example of the scientific advancement of the 20th century or, you know, technical uh, advancement and, telescopes or even you know space exploration or something like that but those values are their values and I think uh, luckily I don't have to decide that case because it's it's really hard um you know, looks like Gail you want to add something yeah I'll just note that you know um it's <sighs> We're here today talking about the work of the CMAI, but the, but we're only one project within the Getty Conservation Institute, and the GCI has, you know, long been conducting research and in the issues of values in heritage place management, and um, you know, I I would suggest that people with interest in this area look at some of our materials on our website, including um. I, I can't. I can't now think of the exact name of the book, but it's it's a book of case studies on um, values in in heritage site management. Not a couple of years ago, which is a available as a as a digital book, so um, it's not something that is um, uh, you know that you have to pay for. Um, and it and it does include. I'm trying to remember because it's been a few years, but at least at least one case study that is dealing with um, indigenous heritage in Australia. Uh, and so, so there are, um, you know, materials available to help kind of guide thinking in, in how to approach values. I just wanted to say that the, the proper title of that book is Consensus Building Negotiation and Conflict Resolution for Heritage Place Management. And uh, Susan so, McDonald just posted Susan that link. Susan McDonald, our colleague, just posted the <laughs> link. We'll make note of the link in the chat box if yeah. uh, people are interested in that. I think it's a it's a very difficult question, but that one that should be asked, you know, if anything, the last couple of days of our conference has been grappling with many of the same uh, issues of, of values and how you weigh the different values of different stakeholders and, you know, um, listen to people who have typically not been listened to in, in past preservation uh, efforts. So thank you very much for that answer. Yeah, and, you know, and I would also note in, in that vein, you know, um, Australia certainly has made uh, great strides in the area of, of applying values, um, using a values-based methodology in, in uh, managing heritage. And um, yeah, I would, I would point um, listeners also to the Burra Charter. Mm. And um, oh gosh, I'll have, to, I'll have to quickly look online to find, there are other publications that, that have been done that, that really would help advance this conversation. Um, uh, in, in making sure to consider um, um, associations and um, uh, those types of things with places that aren't physical characteristics, but are these intangibles. 
Right. Well, and thanks for mentioning the Bird Charter, Gail. That was so groundbreaking. I remember that was important uh, a long time ago. I read that when I was in graduate school, I think, uh, which I won't mention what year. Uh, so I have another question. Uh, so can you speak to the, the natural landscapes theme and the sites and locations that were studied under that theme? Well, that's a pretty broad question. Um, you know, I should probably note something about the, the image galleries that accompany each, the photo galleries that accompany each theme. Um, these were not places that we did in-depth research about and the, and the essays themselves, we tried to be very broad in our discussion of the themes. Um, and so we might mention places, uh, specific places in the essays, but we tried to talk more about categories of places or types of places. And then the image galleries were meant to get it down to that fine level of, um, of uh, places that represent those themes. And so we, we intentionally made the decision not to directly connect the photos, the images to the text. They are kind of a freestanding element. There's a few of them that may be mentioned in the text, but, but most are not. Um, and so let's see, now I've gotten away from the question a little bit. It had to do with- Natural landscapes. Natural landscapes, yeah. Well, and, and of the 10 themes in this publication, I would say that that particular theme on conserving the natural environment and the built environment is the one that is most, you know, most of these themes, they're not things that started in the 20th century. There's, they started, you know, in previous centuries or they have been present throughout human history. Um, but this concept of preserving the environment really is something that grew in the 19th century and, and exploded in the 20th century. Um, so uh, Chandler, you want to help me out? I keep getting away from the question. <laughs> well, I, I think Just how did the you best. select the, how did you select those particular examples? Well, frankly- they illustrate the theme the most. The mm -hmm. things. I mean, the, you know, the, for example, um, during the 20th century, the, the concept of national parks didn't mm -hmm. begin in the 19th century. But the, the, all of the, the frameworks that we use for in the United States, like the, the Secretary of the Interior Standards or even the Venice Charter, or the Borough Charter, these sort of started to codify our concepts of how we take care of historic places. And the same thing was happening in the world in, the, in terms of the natural environment and conservation of natural resources. National, the, every country in the world started developing national parks in the 20th century. So this was, this kind of heightened awareness of natural landscapes is a 20th century theme, um, and as a, also the heightened awareness for um, heritage and building protection and cultural landscapes, all of these things. We started t using these terms in the 20th century. Uh, we started realizing how you know ecology affects every everybody in the world is interconnected. All of these are sort of twentieth in ideas that became uh, written about and codified in the twentieth century. And the photos just are examples that show. Yeah, and and you know I'll, I'll add to that our um, our process for selecting the places that we represented ultimately was long and arduous and complicated. I mean, we had had in identifying types of places, there were certain places that we knew of and wanted to represent, but we also wanted to make sure that we had typological di diversity and geographic diversity and that we represented places all over the world. And we were a team of, you know, um, Australian and American people working on this. So it was, and we also sourced most of our images, almost all of them, um, 130 images or so, maybe 20 of them did not come with, you know, Creative Commons licenses. So we were searching, you know, Wikimedia and, and other places trying to identify. We went through, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was 800 or 1000 possible places that we sorted through and tried to make sure that every theme was represented by a geographic spread and that there wasn't a concentration of sites in Europe or North America. So it, it was partly about just trying to really get that breadth and, and diversity. 
No, I appreciate that because you do work worldwide, which is very difficult. Uh, but the CMAI have, has done such incredible, uh, pivotal, groundbreaking work, really. And I just am so uh, honored that the three of you could join us today. I did post a um, a link to the Burr Charter practice notes is what came up because I only had a second, but from Australia Ecomos. And, and if you want to check that out, everyone can check that out. So just for a closing question, um, uh, what interesting projects are coming up for you all at CMAI? Well, I wanted, one of the things that I think we're kind of excited about, as I mentioned, how we do um, materials research and we've started working and started to do a research project on architectural plastics. And architectural plastics are fun. And architectural plastics are everywhere. And they're sort of quintessentially 20th century materials. So I think we're gonna have a lot of fun with this one. And not a lot has been done about how to conserve architectural plastics. Um, so it's, it's like a big field and we're interested to uh, make a little bit of headway in this. In the meantime, it allows us to look at a lot of really interesting, like all plastic buildings and all the- You have a lab there on site, right? Yeah. At, the, at the Getty, I think I took a tour. <laughs> of it yeah. at one point, it's very interesting. Yeah. And our, our, our art, uh, the art conservation has been looking at the conservation of plastic in art, but nobody has really started looking at it, its appearance in architecture. So I think that's one of our next. next Wonderful, year. how about you, Gail? What is coming up next for you? Oh gosh, um, writing a case study uh, on our conservation work at the our conservation management plan at the Eames um, at the Eames House for the one of the cases that, um, that uh, Chandler mentioned, the one on planning and management tools. That's wonderful. That sounds great. I want to. I can't wait to get back there. And Anna Paula, how about you? What do you got coming up? Um, I think now we're. Kind of excited to get back to to the uh, our research project, the performance evaluation of patch repairs in historic uh, concrete. That um, uh, is, we're partnering with uh, French colleagues and and um, uh, English colleagues to evaluate uh, what has been done in the past in terms of patch repair in historic concrete and how. Uh, if that's working or if that's not working. And I think once we're done with this, we'll be able to provide uh, much better guidance for, for practice, practitioners on uh, what's the state of the art on, uh, on that and uh, how to uh, go about choosing the, the, the best uh, available solution. Um, and with all the pandemic, it kind of it was stalled for a, for a very long time, mm -hmm. as I'm sure everybody here uh, understands. So we're excited to get back to that. That's great. Uh, so I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, but thank you again, all of you, for sharing your expertise with us and with everybody uh, in the Zoom and on Facebook. Uh, John, do you want to wrap it up? Yes, thank you all again. I'm sorry I was at, uh, taking calls and um, I was putting a woman on hold and I didn't want to keep her on hold too long. So anyways, thank you all for your time. And uh, I pasted into the chat box uh, a link to the evaluation form for this session. So just select the Getty session and I'll share that information with our speakers. Uh, and we look forward to having you in the rest of today's programs. So I'm going to close this out now. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much.